It's my very great pleasure to welcome you all to this afternoon's Festival of Ideas session, which is the second in a three-part discussion uh, of the genetic revolution. In this session, we consider the impact of the genetic revolution on our need for food and power, or energy as it's referred to in the public domain. But before we launch into these issues, I'd like to raise the question of what the topic of food, power, and the genetic revolution has to do with identity. While we think to, tend to think of technologies as somehow separate from identity, in fact, genetics has had a profound effect on us, particularly in terms of the Australian farming heritage and love of the bush. Traditional breeding techniques, for example, in the development of the Merino ram and in the pioneering plant breeding uh, uh, carried out most notably by William Farrer, um, th these developments made an in indelible mark on post-European settlement in Australia and created one of the great identities of the nation, that of the Australian farmer and uh, through rural set settlements and attachment to and love of the Australian bush. So how does this new genetic revolution impact on this identity? I argue here that both sides of the deep division in our attitudes to genetically modified crops, for example, can be seen to be supported by different aspects of that great rural tradition. On one side, we have our love of the bush, which in some ways underpins our opposition to, to GM crops through the perception that genetic modification may threaten natural species and ecosystems. In addition, I feel that there's another strand of our, our historical identity that underpins the opposition to genetically modified crops. Because of my, my own, my parents' uh, farming background, I understand the fierce independence and self-reliance that my farming forebears uh, farmer forebears possessed as they settled and began farming some pretty forbidding landscapes on this continent. The development of engineered high-tech strains of plants and animals could uh, arguably increase the power of multinational corporations and thereby threaten to override the independence of farmers and place them under work conditions dictated by large companies. I might add that such pressures uh, exist independent of any GM technological advances. We recently saw, for example, the uh, potato farmers fighting McCain's over uh, conditions being imposed on them. Now, oddly, another aspect of the same identity, our rural bush-loving identity, supports arguments on the other side, that is, arguments for the use of the new technologies to develop genetically modified crops. Agricultural and biological scientists and, and farmers have always been innovative and farming is an area where research and development have de delivered enormous benefits to Australia, making our farming among the most efficient and competitive in the world. For example, using traditional breeding, new crops for dryland agriculture have led to enormously improved yields. I know also that many of the scientists who embrace the new technologies did so in harmony with this strong, Australian, uh, this strong identity of being innovative and believing in the benefits of research and invention. In addition, these scientists that I know were motivated to use genetic modification specifically to protect the environment by, for example, developing crops that don't require heavy insecticide use. And I'm sure we hear more about these types of issues from our speakers. So we see our identity feeding into both sides of that argument. But I'd also like to suggest that the debate around genetic modification and its application to food and we'll hear increasingly to, to power will define our identity over the coming years. Like the climate change debate, the genetic modification debate will tell us a lot about how we respond to risk. Uh, it's a problem that humans have a great deal of trouble dealing with, the, the, the concept of risk. How do we calculate risk? And when do we as a society decide that a risk is high enough or outweighs the, the potential benefits to take preventative action? To illustrate this, this problem with assessing risk, when the first guidelines on the use of recombinant DNA were established at the Asilomar Conference in 1975, the harshest restrictions on experimentation were reserved for species that were most closely related to humans or were disease-causing organisms. And pretty much the restrictions fell away from there as species became less closely related to us. And in fact, some of the weakest um, uh, restrictions were placed on plant research. 
this, this situation has been quite dramatically reversed over those um, 35 years as many of us have come to accept the role of recombinant DNA techniques in improving our health while rejecting a role for the same technologies in plant and animal breeding. Our identity will also be influenced by how we respond to stark choices with regard to agriculture for the third world. For example, genetic modification offers, to, offers the potential to improve the nutritional value of some poorly nutritious third world crops, which could save, let alone improve, the lives of many. Many third world nations are choosing to develop and adopt these strains, but are also being told by members of the first world that they shouldn't because of our perception of the dangers involved. Our attitude to this question will say a lot about who we are and how we engage with our neighbours. Now back to today's session, we've been through a period of time that started with extraordinary claims about the benefits of genetic engineering. Some, but not all of these claims have been realised. But at the same time, we've seen a vigorous argument put forward that any genetic mo modification, particularly of crops, is inherently dangerous and should be forbidden. It's my view that nearly 40 years after the first successful genetic engineering methods were developed, it's now time for a more careful discussion of the use of this technology in terms of the risks and benefits. To help us frame that discussion, we have four eminent speakers here today. Uh, Associate Professor Ben Hankemer from the Institute of Molecular Biosciences at the University of Queensland. Dr Liz Dennis from the CSIRO Division of Plant Industry in Canberra. Professor Phil Batterham from our own Department of Genetics here at the University of Melbourne and Dr Paul Chambers from the Australian Wine Research Institute in Adelaide. The first speaker is Ben Hankemer. Ben is a principal investigator at the Institute for Molecular Bioscience at the University of Queensland, as I just said. Over the past 10 years, he's focused on the development of environmentally friendly, high-efficiency biofuel production systems. This is a rapidly expanding area of biotechnology. His specialisation is in the structural biology of the photosynthetic machinery, which drives the conversion of solar energy into chemical energy or fuels. Using this knowledge, he embarked on the targeted engineering of green algae for high-efficiency biofuel production. To facilitate this work, he founded the Solar Biofuels Consortium, which he now directs. The consortium includes eight international teams and conducts a coordinated research program of parallel research streams that include economic analysis, a variety of uh, aspects of scientific research and bioreactor scale-up. Scale Would you join me in welcoming Ben to speak to you? Thank you, Robert, and thank you to the organisers for inviting me. So, uh, the, obviously this session this afternoon is on crops and on uh, fuel, and what I wanted to do is to provide a, a general overview of, of the work that we do. There we go. I wanted to put this picture up. It was a, a picture that I was uh, provided with by Michael Hegelberg from Arizona State University, and I like it because it basically demonstrates pictorially what plants do and that is catch solar energy to do work, and they store the energy that they catch from the sun to make chemical energy, which can be stored as the form of food or products that you can convert to fuels, such as oils. You can use um, certain types of algae for hydrogen production, for example. You can use the biomass and convert it to methane through fermentation, and also the fermentation of sugar products to ethanol. This picture is one that I wanted to put up in order to try and dem uh, just illustrate the problems that we're facing. So over the last few decades, actually, our population worldwide has expanded enormously. And so now we're about 6.8 uh, .8 billion people. And it's anticipated that we will be about 9 billion people by 2050. And all of us, therefore, will require more food. We will require feed for animals in order to provide that food. We will require fresh water fuel and also chemical feedstocks. And so there's a whole range of products that we will need uh, increasingly as a society. And 
to give you an idea about this, recently the UK chief scientist issued a paper in which he stated that we will require something of the order of 30 to 50 percent more of each of those products by 2050, which is a huge amount of extra production that we require. And you might note the fact that at the moment we are faced with rising fuel prices. Now, there's been a lot of debate about that, whether that's related to biofuels, whether it's related to the distribution of products, or whether it's simply that we've uh, plateaued in our ability to produce that the arable land that we have. But one thing that we will have to do, do is to adapt to all the production and, uh, of all of these products in the context of climate change. One where we might anticipate that production would go down, but also that we have to move towards more CO2 neutral types of systems. Actually, let me just pop back. One more point I wanted to make is the chemical feedstocks one is also an interesting one. The, there's a whole range of products that we make from oil, etc. And yesterday, Matt Ridley make, gave a beautiful talk and was talking about the developments and the, the ra rapid increase in gross domestic product per person that we have seen over the last few decades and how that has improved through inventiveness. And one thing that we've one thing that is clear at the moment, at least over the last 20 years or so, 30 years of trend, is that the amount of gross domestic product that we produce is directly correlated with the amount of fuel that we use. Similarly, products such as, for example, fish oils, which can be uh, uh, traditionally been produced from fish, are now being extracted from krill, which of course the feedstocks for fish, and they often get it from algae. So the Consortium that I founded is really working on uh, using algae for biofuel production, and we've done a lot of economic analysis. I won't go into the details of this, but it shows often that there's value of co-producing things like biomass for animal feed or high-value products. So what we do is a range of things, and what we'd like to do, ideally, it was the technology was really inspired by the ability to use non-arable land to site algae on non-arable land positions and therefore eliminating that food versus fuel issue that has been raised through first generation biofuel crops. The ability for certain algae to grow in saline water streams, I wouldn't say at the moment that we're there at any commercial level with, with saline systems except for high value product production, but it's something that we need to look at. And the other one is the ability to use carbon dioxide because that's what plant use, plants use during photosynthesis. And so you have the ability to close that loop of CO2 emissions if you can use that CO2 for the production of biomass. There's obviously a whole range of work to be done in the biology, both through traditional breeding and through GM crops. And there's a whole range of products, uh, projects being conducted in the space of engineering. So there's a range of systems from open ponds through to closed reactor systems of many different designs. And so at the end, there are a whole range of products, for example, pigments that we have come to, to use a lot, uh, beta carotenes for the egg and fish industry, bio, oils for biodiesel, methane for fuel production in, is a major focus now in Europe. Hydrogen is also another one that's an interesting one in the context of climate change. If you want to move to 80% CO, CO2 emissions reductions by 2050, Hydrogen might be something that we need to consider. The other interesting point is that you can actually take the biomass and you can put it through a controlled burning process called pyrolysis. And that generates a charcoal-like product and effectively allows you to sequester carbon. So one of the things that you need to think about is that we don't only need to limit our emissions of CO2, we actually need to reverse it. So we, we're, still, we're already above a level that uh, the IPCC is deemed as being dangerous and that we uh, need to limit our emissions, but ultimately if we continue rising at the rate we're at, we're going to have to come down again. And so we need technologies to actually sequester carbon, and this is one of those tech ap applications that could be used. Here's a vision kind of figure, and uh, this is not for me, I've, I've referenced it there at the bottom, but the idea really is to show some kind of bioreactor system or open pond system on non-arable land. Now, Within the context of what we do, we've, we've gone more down the closed reactor system simply because the use of large open ponds would require a great deal of water, though if with saline systems that may be possible. But there are a whole range of different designs that you can see here. There are a lot of visionary statements. For example, this picture you see here on the right 
is uh, pretty much the same picture as you see there now. It's just that Photoshop has changed it from water to soil, and so there's been a lot of hype in the area. We aren't there in terms of commercial production yet, but it's certainly a vision statement that we should be aware of. Here are a whole range of different types of reactors. The one that you see on the right-hand side at the bottom costs about 100 euros a square meter. We need to get down for biofuel production around the 10 or 20 dollar mark, something like that. So this website I just put up in order to demonstrate to you can go and have a look at this website, World Clocks, and see that the population is rising and the productive land is going down. Actually, we have about 4% of our land is arable, 3.9, 3 and going down. 25% of, uh, of the surface area of the earth is non-arable. And when you do the calculations, for all our, f all our fuel production, you would require something of the order of 3 to 4% at current efficiencies for biofuels. So you can raise the efficiency, and you need to think about moving towards non-arable land. Now, there's often this sort of black and white position of uh, GMOs versus the environment. And one of the points that I wanted to make, really, that it really isn't quite that black and white. And we have to decide what future we want, you know, it's, um, and also what we can responsibly aim for. So, for example, one might aim for an environmental ideal of having a pristine GMO-free environment. But you also have to face the fact that we will need to face 9 billion people. Now, I'm not saying that GMOs will be all the solutions for this, but it's certainly something that we need to put into the mix and consider. All right. So main, the main concerns that people have raised are, are generally the health of GM foods, patents-based controls of crops and food security, whether there's certain um, corporations which control that, um, degradation of native environments through mass cultivation of GM crops, the disruption of food chains, so for example, if you in, in, in introduce um, genes which uh, confer insect uh, resistance, that sort of thing. And the other one is scientists playing God, which was an issue that was raised this morning as well in, this, in the previous session. On the, on the benefit side, really that we can hopefully achieve improved crop, uh, crop production more food on less land, if you like. With algae, we have the ability to breed much more rapidly than with traditional crop systems. So we, can, we have life cycles of a day or hours, and so we can go through multiple refinements to generate a range of different products. And uh, Liz will also be talking about those in crop plants later on. Salt tolerance is another one that we're actively looking at, the ability to use algae and increase their salt tolerance so that we can use uh, the vast majority of water that's available to us. We aren't personally looking at chemical resistance to pesticides, but it's clearly an issue in, in the plant area. New products, a whole range of products, so you can target that solar energy into a particular product stream, a, a particular form of chemical energy. Virus resistance is another one, so you can have resistant crop production. And the other point is that really that Australia is an important agricultural exporter. And uh, so for this reason, it's important also that we develop those opportunities for Australian farmers. And there's also an element of environmental protection in the fact that if we, if we don't do anything about CO2 emissions and producing clean fuels for the future, we'll be faced with other environmental damage, which we will need to deal with. So, you know, there's pros and cons to everything, and those are things that we have to put in the mix and discuss. So this is my final slide. And I just wanted to summarize it to say that with careful thought, good science, good legislation and controls, the benefits of GMOs could be obtained with benefits to health, e.g. vitamin A rice, and natural habitats, e.g. microalgal systems for biofuel production on non-arable land. Not all GMO systems will be beneficial, nor will all be, of them be bad, and the good should be selected and the bad should be rejected. And that, I think, is something that has come out of this discussion from yesterday and today about what our society wants and where we would like to take it. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Uh, I forgot to mention that uh, the way that we've structured this session is that there'll be uh, short um, talks from, from each of us, uh, and that will be followed by plenty of time to ask questions. So uh, I'll ask you to hold your questions uh, until the end of the session. Uh, the next speaker is Liz Dennis. Liz is a CSIRO fellow with a long-term interest in and contribution to plant molecular biology. She's made crucial contributions to our understanding of gene regulation in plants, in flowering, and in the molecular basis of fibre development in cotton. 
She's a fellow of the Australian Academy of Science and in 2000 she was a co the, the co-winner of the inaugural Prime Minister's Prize for Science for her work on flowering. So I'd like to uh, ask you to join me in welcoming Liz. Thanks, Rob, and thanks, Patrick, for in and your workers for inviting me to talk to this session. Now, as Ben has said, one of the great problems facing the world today is how to feed the 9 million people that are predicted to inhabit the planet by the year 2040. And that means that we have to grow as much food in the next 30 years as has ever been grown in the history of the world. And if we fail to do this, I think the results will be political instability and food riots and Australia, as an important exporter of food, has a, a, an important role to play in solving this food problem. As well as making more food, food needs to be more nutritional. As we've got people... Many people in Asia and, and Africa using single, uh, a single crop as a staple and many of those crops are deficient, in particular vitamins or micronutrients. So we have to try and solve that problem. And as well, there are lifestyle diseases such as diabetes that altered nutrition in food could probably help as well. So we need to grow this food on less land and probably with more consideration for the environmental consequences of farming than we've had in the past. And all this in the context of changing climate. So the problems are quite uh, immense and I'd say that we need to use all the tools we have available and that includes genetic modification of plants. So what, so as was pointed out this morning, all organisms contain DNA in the nucleus and that DNA is, contains all the genes, that is the sequences that code for proteins, but as well it contains the sequences that ensure those genes are active in the right place at the right time and the right amount. For example, leaf genes are active in leaves, root genes are active in roots. So we have the genes and the products they encode, but as well we have the control sequences. So what do we do when we make a GM plant? Well, we take a gene and that gene, the coding sequence can come from any organism because DNA the, the, the DNA code is universal, so any gene, the gene can be taken from any organism, but the control sequences to ensure that it's active in the right places are generally taken from plants. So we take a gene, we fit it with the right control sequences, and we splice it into the genome of the uh, crop plant that we're interested in modifying. So... Usually, there's only one or two genes altered in the whole context of the 30,000 genes that make up a plant. Now, should we be worried about eating these genes? Well, every mouthful that we eat of our food contains many thousands of genes. And these genes are just processed by the digestive system along with any food. So where do I think that GM can assist us tackle this problem of improved food and food security and food nutrition? So the major, the major crops that have been modified at the moment are cotton, maize, soybean and canola. And all these, uh, all these crops have a large GM, uh, GM production. And if you look at this slide, you can see that the level of GM crops from 1986 to 2006 has really dramatically increased 
going from almost zero to 125 million hectares worldwide, and that's continued increasing since 2008. And many, many farmers have embraced this technology. Those 13 million farmers are both in developing and in uh, developed countries. So GM has really increased in, in, uh, globally. So what do we think that GM can do? How can it assist? And I must say it assists in normal traditional plant breeding. This is on top of traditional plant breeding. So the first thing is increased productivity, more food. Secondly, less destruction of the environment. And thirdly, improved health through enhanced nutrition. So let's look at productivity. And I might point out that some of these, the things that we are finding out by using gene technology to understand plants have actually given us very, some very surprising results. And here's one shown uh, in this slide. This is a wheat plant. And by altering, by knocking out where a gene is active, a, a gene involved in starch metabolism, we found that in, in well, scientists in CSRO have found that you can get something like a 30% increase in yield by altering where a gene is expressed that, that affects where the, uh, the mobilization of starch. So this sort of unexpected result can really lead to uh, increases in productivity. A second, a second way of increasing productivity is to improve disease resistance. There's a lot of crop loss through the world through diseases and for example, this is a barley and a virus called barley yellow dwarf virus, which stunts barley. You can see on the right-hand side of the picture a plant that's infected with the barley yellow dwarf virus. But by making a GM construct that knocks down the expression of the genes, the activity of the genes from the virus, we can protect the plants against the virus. So this sort of technology where you improve disease resistance is a fairly straightforward way of using GM to improve crop productivity. Uh, long chain omega-3 oils are essential to our diets and we can't make them. We have to gain these omega-3 oils. We generally get it from eating fish. But as you've probably read, the fish catches in the world are decreasing and there's increasing pressure on our fish stocks, so we really have to get them from somewhere else. So by taking uh, genes from marine microalgae and inserting them, the genes that make uh, these omega oils, that convert the omega oils that we can't do, if by adding these genes to plants, we can make the oil profile of uh, oilseed plants look exactly like the oil profile of uh, tuna. So we believe that eating these plants will do you just as good with the omega-3 oils as eating fish. And so this provides an alternate source of these essential oils, which are important for at least for cardiovascular health, but also for other other. Uh, probably for other health reasons, uh, we can use, take the pressure off the fish and use plants. For the developing world, you've probably read about golden rice. Well, rice, uh, something like uh, 120 million people worldwide uh, use rice as the sole, pretty well the sole source of food. Now, rice is lacking in uh, vitamin A, and something like one to two million people a year die through vitamin A deficiency, and 500,000 people have irreversible blindness, and a lot of those are children. So by incorporating genes that make the precursor of vitamin A, pro-vitamin A, a beta-carotene, in rice, in the part of rice that you eat, we hope, or it's hoped, that the... Uh, if people were eat this golden rice, um, then they would overcome the vitamin A deficiency. 
This rice contains two genes, one from maize and one from a bacterium, that together, when added to the rice, allow rice to make the precursor of vitamin A that humans now can convert to vitamin A, in this way overcoming the lack of vitamin A in rice. It's hoped that this rice will be available in 2012 after doing all the field trials and tests that are needed. Now to the environment. Cotton has been a, traditionally a crop that is very subject to insect pests. And in Australia, it's particularly subjected to insect pests. We have a lot of pests that eat cotton. And before the advent of uh, GM cotton, there were, there were 14 crops used up to 14 sprays like this of insecticide. Now, insecticides are not very good for people or for fish or for insects that aren't ta uh, that, are, that are non even for insects that aren't pests so it's very non discriminatory and it, it it can kill other other animals other organisms and other insects so in cotton Two genes have been added from a bacterium, a pair of genes, to ensure that resistance doesn't build up. These genes are from a bacterium called Bacillus thuringiensis, which is the bacteria have been used in horticulture as dipel for many years to, as, as a protection, but it's much more efficient to incorporate the genes into the cotton. And you can see here how uh, the uptake of GM cotton in Australia from something like 10% in 19... 98, is it? I think it's 1998. 1996. 1996 to 2008 has gone from 10% of the crop now to over 90% of the crop. And accompanying that has been a 90% reduction in the amount of pesticides used, which has really had very good effects for the environment. And so using these genes just these two genes that specifically kill Lepidopteran insects, which are the main pests of the cotton crop. It, it, we find that the beneficial insects, the insects that aren't pests, are spared, they're not targeted, and as well as that, there's not all that insecticide going into the environment. So I think that's had a substantial improvement on the environment in the cotton growing areas. So, in summary, what do I think? I think we have to use all the tools that are available to us to try and innovate our agriculture, and this includes GM. At present, we use GM in a number of crops. We don't use it in wheat. We only use it to try and investigate the biology of, the, of, of, of wheat, you know, what, gene, what, what genes are important to get particular benefits. I hope in the future that we can use GM crops as well as using the technology to understand the, gene, uh, the genes involved so that in future we'll have non-GM, tr traditional breeding, but we'll have the added benefit of GM to enhance our production. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Uh, the next speaker is Professor Phil Batterham. Uh, Phil is a professor of genetics at the University of Melbourne. He carries out research on insect pest control using insecticides and genetically modified organisms. And he's passionate about global health and development issues. And uh, evidence for this is that last year he organised the United Nations Conference on the Millennium Development Goals held here in Melbourne. Uh, I can also say, tell you that Phil puts a lot of his energy into engaging with the community on science. So it's a pleasure to welcome Phil for the next talk. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> so we've already heard from uh, the preceding speakers that we really need to be more effective in producing food. We need higher productivity per hectare because the number of people in the world is rapidly ramping up and the amount of land available for agriculture is ramping down. The ratio gets worse as we speak. 
And obviously we're seeing that factored into food prices, which are high here and all over the world and getting worse every year and will continue to rise. So part of the solution to improved agricultural productivity is to cut productivity losses, um, which are due to insect pests and to diseases. So on this slide you see a couple of major insect pests. The one on the top is called the cotton bollworm. It's a bit of a misnomer, which I'll come to in a moment. Um, but it is probably the biggest agricultural pest on the face of the earth. The one on the bottom is a local friend. We call it the Australian sheep blowfly. Uh, but it's no friend to sheep um, because it causes um, a lot of pain and suffering and causes great control costs for Australian agriculture. Back to the cotton bollworm, um, you see here the distribution um, of two very, very closely related species of cotton bollworm and together with CSIRO we are involved in a genome project to analyse these species and maybe to look for their Achilles heel. But their global impact in the negative sense every year is estimated at $5 billion US. So that's a huge impact and it's not just on cotton because this species goes after almost anything that's green and vertical and there are about 200 species of agricultural crop plants that it will call home and food and devour. So one of the traditional ways of controlling insect pests, and in fact a major way of controlling insect pests, is with chemicals. This picture was taken a couple of years ago in India. It was taken in a street where every shop um, basically sells chemicals because the control of insect pests is such a major issue. There are about 20 million cotton farmers in India. Now, the application of insecticides in India is not quite like it is in Australia with those crop dusting planes. Here you see someone walking through a field with a backpack. And they might do that 15 to 30 times in a season, spraying a chemical of unknown mode of action. And I would like to show this slide and ask people where is the maximum exposure and I think it's on the person applying the insecticide. Insect pests can be devastating and you see a picture here of a couple of, of plants, a couple of cauliflower plants and one has been absolutely devoured and is useless by the moth that you see there which is the diamondback moth. So the problem is real and the problem is big. So what do insecticides do and how do, plants, uh, how do insects become resistant to them? So on this slide you can see um, my knowledge of chemics, uh, chemistry um, detailed. Um, my knowledge of chemistry is, is very basic. So here's an insecticide shown as a, a blue shape. It enters a cell and it binds to a protein shown in orange. The protein is the target. Now it's the interaction between the insecticide and the protein that is going to kill the insect. Well, insects become resistant to insecticides and they do it one of two ways. In this cartoon here, the insecticide enters the cell and these little yellow circles represent enzymes which are produced in greater abundance in the resistant organism and they break the chemical down before it gets to the target. And this usually happens in the insect gut, which is shown beautifully from a slide from, uh, from my lab. This second mechanism is target site modification. Here you get a mutation in the gene that produces the target and the target is slightly altered by this mutation. It can carry on its normal function but it's unable to bind the insecticide. And most targets are in the nervous system and here's a lovely picture um, of insect nervous system developing. So targets become very important in helping us to understand what insecticides do. And it turns out that we are really ignorant of insecticide targets. Given the huge amount of insecticides that are used in the world, you might imagine that we have a very clear idea of what they do. But in fact, many insecticides are released into the field, and at the point in time they are first used in the field, we don't know what they do at all. So I've actually been able to generate quite a lot of research funding in using different chemicals that are currently being applied in the field in Australia and elsewhere and actually finding out what they do. And we do something very simple. We take this organism here, which is not a pest, this lovely little fly Drosophila, and we make mutants and basically screen with insecticides for mutants that are resistant. 
and then we find the genes. Now it turns out that the genes that we find that encode targets happen to be the same genes that produce targets of these insecticides in insect pests. So we can in fact use this organism to not only find what the targets are for chemicals that are out there in the field, but in fact we can predict what the targets would be for insecticides that are yet to be used. And a couple of really nice examples from work done in my lab by uh, Trent Perry, and he's looking at these ion channels, which are very complex structures in the nervous system, carry nerve impulses, and he was able to find that for compounds that resemble nicotine, neonicotinoids, there are a couple of subunits of this complex structure that are in fact targeted by these compounds. And for another class of compounds, which are actually biopesticides and supposedly a little more environmentally friendly, they do basically the same thing, but they target a different subunit of the receptor. I very strongly believe, based on research, my research, that it's very important to understand these targets so that we can be confident that, you know, basically um, insecticides are acting for good to try and ensure that insecticides would do little collateral damage in the environment. And unfortunately, so many of the insecticides that are available for use today do a huge amount of collateral damage, as Liz has alluded to. I think these kind of understandings that come from our research can allow us to design better insecticides that would have lower environmental impact. And in my lab at the moment, we're looking at combination therapies that would allow us to use less insecticide to have a greater impact. Now, in contrast to our ignorance of the targets of chemical insecticides, we have an exquisitely detailed knowledge of GM insecticides, the BT toxin that Liz referred to. So I won't go through this cartoon in, in gory detail, but here's this BT toxin. It's being ingested. It's being ingested from a, a BT plant, a transgenic plant. It's eaten by the caterpillar of the moth. It finds its way down into the gut. It attaches to the gut membrane, and it drills holes into the gut membrane, membrane which just leaks like a sieve, and it kills the, the caterpillar. We know in great detail what this insecticide is doing. Now, because of my interest in the developing world, um, we, as a group, got involved in an international initiative to produce cauliflower and cabbages that were transgenic, um, carrying BT genes. In fact, two different BT genes that had different targets um, in the gut. And this was a, an international network project, and it was a very interesting private-public partnership. The deal was that a corporation, Nunnams, would produce the transgenic crops, and then a group of public partners with public money would basically evaluate these crops in terms of their safety and efficacy, preparing these crops for registration around the world. There was a deal struck initially that Nunnams would control the distribution of these crops in the developing world, whereas the, the uh, distribution um, in the developing world uh, would be controlled by um, these public part parties. And this was a very large undertaking. It received high-level endorsement, very importantly endorsement from the Indian government right up to the level of the Prime Minister. And this was important because India was one of the first places where these crops would be used. And the process of producing this crop took several years. And I just show a timeline here from the first transgenic plants that were produced. And you go through this timeline and you see just a huge number of steps. Um, and this step here is one where we know that we've got something that's probably worthy of release in the field. So several years of exhaustive research and then a whole lot more before you could get to a point of registration. And so this project was very successful, able to produce cauliflowers and cabbages that looked a whole lot healthier when they were challenged to moths than did their non-GM counterparts. Very exciting. Until someone arrives in your lab one day to autoclave to kill all of your plant stocks, all of your seed, and goes through those field houses in India to do the same. Because the, the burden of trying to get these products onto the market and released 
anywhere in the world was a challenge that was a bridge too far because there were issues of liability and different liabilities uh, regimes that would um, occur around the world, stewardship issues in that you had to take responsibility as a corporation for every last seed basically that was produced, um, no matter how much other people would abuse it along the way, and a really uncertain approvals process. And so the, the, the corporate partner basically pulled out and destroyed all of the, the plants and almost a decade's research just went down the drain. And some of these regulatory requirements are absolutely bizarre. This is the most bizarre that you, you basically force feed cows in India, sacred animal, cauliflowers and cabbages, to see whether they are impacted by these GM crops. Um, they're not, but you can't really test them. Uh, you can only look at milk and blood. You can't kill them. You can't do autopsies. You can't do anything. So I have some, a fairly balanced view, I like to think, um, about the use of chemical insecticides because I work on them, um, GM crops because I've worked on them. And as with the other speakers you've heard today, I really believe that we need to make rational decisions. We are using massive amounts of chemicals to produce our food. The figures are actually hard to get, but about one kilogram for each one of you in the audience is used. And these are potent chemicals that are active at exquisitely low concentrations. And we don't know that much about what they do. And we have some false dichotomies. So as an organic farmer, you can't use synthetic chemicals, but you can use natural chemicals that are incredibly similar to the synthetic chemicals. Uh, you can apply the Bt bacteria, um, but you can't grow a plant that has a Bt gene in it. And then there are these distracting arguments. One night I went to a pancake restaurant, which shall remain nameless, and they said you, you, they don't use any GM product because it might cause allergies. Now think about that statement. What's in a pancake? Eggs, milk, flour. Can anybody think of any more potent allergens than those? Um, and they're saying that something else might be an allergen. Uh, so that, that concerns me. Um, and I am very concerned about the activity of the anti-GM environmental movement because I think they work to preserve status quo. I think they work to kill debate. And if you're preserving status quo, you really should line up with the chemical companies and ask for money because what you're doing is actually preserving their profits. And I'm very concerned about the level of debate that we have in this country. So what I would be calling for is consistent application of rational decision-making principles by governments, primary producers, environmental movement and the general public. We need to consider all options that are at our, dis at our disposal. And we need to choose the best options for each circumstance in terms of cost and effectiveness, low environmental impact, safety for humans. And we need to apply equal rigour in considering GM, insecticide and organic options. And the best solution will not always be GM and the worst solution will not always be GM. We need to turn our brains on and evaluate what's available to us and make good decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Uh, the next speaker is Paul Chambers. Paul is currently the research manager uh, of the Australian Wine Research Institute in Adelaide. He has expertise in molecular genetics with a focus on the genetics of the yeast used in winemaking, baking and brewing. His current research focuses on the development of new yeast strains with improved performance and quality outputs. He also has a particular interest in the evolution of domesticated species. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks, Paul. Um, thank you, Rob, and, and thank you, Patrick, for the invitation to present today. It's, it's a real privilege to be here. I'm going to be talking to you about wine and about the Australian wine industry and the connection with that and Australian identity and connect that up with how science and technology has played a central role in the success of the industry. Uh, wine has been in Australia since first white settlement. 
There are records going back to the very first ships coming out to Australia bringing vines with them. Australia, you may not know, Australia has some of the oldest vineyards in the world. European vines were wiped out by phylloxera and had to be replanted some time ago. Australian vines weren't hit by that. So we have the most amazing history of winemaking in Australia. The Hill of Grace Vineyard in Eden Valley in South Australia is over 150 years old. Difficult to put an exact age on it. It was planted originally for the local Lutheran community there to provide altar wine for the local church and maybe churches today should have a think about that. I think we'd get a lot more people along to congregations <laughs> if we had a drop of Hill of Grace to go with the communion. Yeah. And, and it was for the local com community. So wine didn't really become a part of the, the, the sort of pan-Australian identity until much later times. It tended to sit in local communities and serve those local communities in various ways. It's really come of age in the last 40 to 50 years. And we can probably trace that back to something else that's been shaping Australian identity, and that's migration. Migrants from the Mediterranean brought wonderful foods and wine with them and changed the Australian cultural landscape enormously in the process of doing that. So we've ended up now with fantastic foods and wonderful wines. The Australian wine industry has been very, very proactive in, in, in growing its industry and in producing top quality wines at affordable prices. And it's used science and technology unashamedly to get there. The Australian industry embraces science and technology and has utilized it to grow one of the most successful wine industries in the world. I'm biased, of course. Grape growers and winemakers of Australia pay my salary to do this, but I think the history books would support what I'm saying in this respect. The title of the talk um, is perhaps a little bit pretentious. The, pretend, the, the, the title of the talk came about following a second glass of wine, so wine has actually <laughs> played a part in shaping the title of this presentation. I got a call late last week, or an email late last week, saying, Paul, you've got to get your talk in by close of business tomorrow. And I had just finished dinner and had some fantastic Pinot from Mornington Peninsula. So I was in a really mellow frame of mind, cruised along nicely. So I came up with this pretentious title, Tailoring Wine Yeast to Sustain Dionysus. I'll talk about Dionysus a little bit later as we move into this, but the, the, the real theme of the talk here is wine yeast and what we're doing with wine yeast to um, serve the Australian industry. Just a quick, quick reminder of what yeast are. These are fungi. Yeast are unicellular, single-celled fungi. Um, they come in, in, in a range of shapes and sizes, but, but fairly limited. Um, we have these rather, just get the pointer, these rather rude-looking yeasts down here, and these beautiful yeasts here. These are the ones that I work on. And, and the distance, the evolutionary distance between these two yeasts is about as great as the evolutionary, dis evolutionary distance between any of us and one of these. They're hugely, hugely divergent. There's probably about 600,000 different species of yeast, but there's really only one or two that are of great importance in an industrial context. And they're the yeasts that are used in, in brewing, in baking, wine making, chocolate making as well, by the way. Cocoa beans are fermented as part of the process of making chocolate, as are cocoa beans. And more recently, used in bioethanol production and pharmaceutical production. These are domesticated yeasts, yeasts that we've bred specifically to use for industrial application. The domesticated yeast that I'm most interested in, the, the, the organism that I love, is this thing here, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Saccharomyces cerevisiae, it's about a tenth the size of a cell in your body and about ten times bigger than a bacterial cell. Um, quite, quite beautiful. I don't know if you can see from where you're sitting, there are these scars on the surface where the cell divides, it buds and breaks off to produce daughter cells. It goes through sexual and asexual reproduction. If you could actually shrink yourself down small enough, think about a science fiction thing, if you could shrink yourself down small enough and climb into one of these cells, it's going to look like one of your cells. It has an, it's like a little metropolis in there. There are little vehicles running along tram tracks, delivering things from one compartment to another, compartments doing different functions of the cell. 
Um, we, we know so much about this yeast cell. Nobel Prizes have been won on the back of this yeast cell because it's very like our cells. It's used in cancer research. It's used in research on Alzheimer's disease and all kinds of things. Um, but the, the, the ones I most love are the ones that make wine. Not just because I love wine, but because we can learn so much about evolution and biology from studying these yeasts in a wine context. So products of domestication. These yeasts are domesticated, and domesticated organisms are things that have been bred, produced by humans, shaped by humans, often over many thousands of years. Here's two examples of dogs. These things are actually very similar genetically. They have a common ancestor somewhere around about the Middle East, going back maybe 10 to 15,000 years ago. So they've been around a long time, dogs, and have been shaped by humans by breeding programs. Uh, nothing like yeast, of course. I just want to illustrate the point that domestication produces extreme forms. Darwin dedicated the first couple of chapters of his Origin of the Species to domestication to illustrate how evolution occurs or to use as an evidence for evolution having occurred. Domestication of this beautiful wine yeast then occurred probably as long ago as 7,000 years ago, the starting points. We have evidence for wine production in Iran about six to 7,000 years ago, beer production about 6,000 years ago. We, we don't know how it all got started, of course, but my best guess is something like this. You have someone who has grape vines and they produce grapes for fruit and the fruit's delicious and they love it and one day they pick the fruit and forget about it and they come back to it a week later and the juice from that fruit is actually a little bit more interesting than the fruit. <laughs> so much more interesting they then decide to go through the first stages of what I call biotechnology in this sense. They pick grapes they change the way they do it. They'll change the kind of inoculation. Not, not scientifically in that it's informed. They don't know microorganisms are involved in this. They just know that if they use this barrel over here, they get fantastic wine from these grapes over here. And they pass that on culturally from one generation to the next, not through scientifically peer-reviewed journals, but it's nonetheless a form of science, early science at work. So wine beer making, etc., has been with us and has shaped science in lots of different ways. So I would argue biotech winemaking is probably one of the first biotechnologies. So this is where Dionysus comes into this presentation. Dionysus was the Greek god of the grapevine, wine, and pleasure. Pleasure is an important thing in life, a very important thing in life. Dionysus um, then should be part, I think, of our considerations of where we go with our technologies. We don't want to lose that tradition of wine moving into our new technologies. So I'm going to keep Dionysus on these slides from here just to remind us of a connection with a, an, an age-old tradition. Dionysus um, was reinvented by the Romans as Bacchus, so you may have come across Bacchus if you haven't heard of Dionysus. So humans then have been satisfying Dionysus, this, this pleasure god, this wine god. For thousands of years, we've been moving grapevines around the world. We've been taking clones of them to get new varieties. We've been inadvertently selecting yeast and some of the bacteria that we find in fermentations to get good outcomes. The new biotechnology then, the new biotechnology knows we now know the microorganisms that are involved in fermentation, and we've isolated them, and we have lots of different wine yeast strains, probably hundreds, probably hundreds of different wine yeast strains out there. It's by strain, I mean a genetic lineage. Different wine yeasts produce, produce different outcomes in fermentations. You can get quite different wines. So this figure here is supposed to illustrate that you take some grapes, you crush them, you separate those grapes off into different fermenters, ferment them with different yeast strains, and you end up with wines that consumers describe in different ways. So this one's a bit sort of pineapple-y with a bit of banana and a bit of passion fruit, whereas this wine came out with, I can't see what that one is, a mixed fruit at the bottom there. Um, so we get different fruity characters, different flavors for different palates using different yeasts. It's not as exaggerated as this cartoon would suggest, but 
Even I can pick it out, and I've got a lousy, lousy sense of taste and smell. So I can pick the differences of different wine yeasts. So that's the first stages of biotechnology, but we can go beyond that. Some of the things that we would like to be able to do would be to add new flavors to the wines that we get, make more complex flavors, bring different mixes of flavors together. We would also like to be able to reduce the alcohol content of wine. Now, this sounds very anti-Dionysian. It sounds very... But it's actually not, because remember, it's all about pleasure. It's about trying to get the best, trying to get good things out of life. And I would argue that if we can get the alcohol content down in wine, that has a real positive impact on health, and that's important. But you can actually develop an awful lot more fruit and mouthfeel character in wine with less alcohol. There are many other targets as well, but they're two that are perhaps easy to convey in a short session. So how is this achieved? There are essentially two approaches that we use currently. The, the group that I manage, we have about 20 scientists who, who work on these projects in yeast and come from a range of backgrounds. And some of them focus more on traditional breeding techniques. You, Saccharomyces cerevisiae has a sexual cycle, so you can mate it, you can follow breeding lines, you can follow the genetics of it. You can also mutagenize it with chemicals. Actually, it's quite ironic that this is acceptable, although it's non-GM. So you can zap an organism that's going to go into the food world with UV irradiation, induce thousands of mutations at random across the genome, and if you're happy with the product, it goes out onto the shelves soon after. There aren't so, whereas with the GM approach that I'm going to talk about in a second, we have a level of precision and care that we can introduce into the development of our yeast streams and a quality assurance, which is perhaps much stronger, much better than the more traditional approaches. So we use traditional approaches. There are some things that that is good for, very complex genetic traits. It's good to use traditional approaches for those because we don't necessarily know which genes to target. But the main driver is this note that I've got at the bottom of the screen here, and I need to emphasize that the, this, the Australian wine industry does not use any genetically modified organisms in wine production. And the driver for that is really consumer sentiment, particularly in export markets. We can't afford to risk losing export markets by bringing GMOs into wine production at this time. The new biotechnology, bringing GMOs in, as I said before, brings a precision with it. We can, we've actually generated some wine yeast that produce substantially less alcohol and have the potential to make really, really good wine. But we have those sitting on the laboratory shelf currently, hoping that one day we'll have an opportunity to take them out to test in a, in a real world setting. We have some amazing strains that produce flavors that are absolutely phenomenal. But again, we're not using those currently. They're sitting on the shelf. They show us what the potential is. They show us what a yeast cell is capable of doing, but we're not able to get there with the traditional approaches. Something I'd like to, to mention here in terms of GMOs, there are essentially two major classes of GMO that we're interested in in the work we do. So-called self-cloned GMOs, and then transgenic GMOs. Self-cloned GMOs have no foreign DNA in them at all. They have only Saccharomyces cerevisiae genetic material inside of them. We make them, however, by using genetic engineering techniques. We remove any foreign DNA that's been involved in the process getting there. But the pathway to get there, the technology itself, is what defines a GMO in an Australian, New Zealand, and European context. In the US, self-cloned organisms wouldn't be regarded as genetically modified organisms. Transgenics, then, are organisms where we take genes across species barriers, so we borrow genes from other organisms and introduce them into our host strains. And we have some of those as well, but our view is that consumer sentiment is going to be far more likely to be accepting of self-cloned, non-transgenic, in other words, GMOs before transgenic varieties. So which is the best traditional versus the new biotechnology? The new biotechnology opens up so many vistas for us that I, I'm hoping that one day we'll be able to convince consumers out there that um, this is the best and safest way to go. 
in generating new foods and, and new products for the food industry. Um, this is another representation of Dionysus. Uh, this is uh, much later. The earlier one that I showed was a, a statue of Dionysus that was a Roman reproduction of a Greek statue. I think it dates back to about the second century. This is from the 16th century by an Italian artist. And I'm not sure why I put this in. And I think it had something to do with that second glass of wine. So when I went back to the talk after it, I thought, I don't know what I'm... It's presumably when this slide went in, I had something really smart to say. But I don't know what it was. I had written on the slide, Sustaining Dionysus. And I think maybe what I was thinking there was that there is something about Australian culture that fits well with this Dionysian attitude. This thing about, you know, we live in a country. It's, it's often referred to as the lucky country. We embrace change, we embrace new things, we have a pioneering attitude, and we love good things, we love the good life. So perhaps that's why I put this slide in. But I do apologise for the pretense, and I'll leave you with one last picture of an Australian landscape. Thank you.